<laughs> I don't think I've seen that movie in years. All right, so, doo -doo -doo -doo. all right, so I'm going to go ahead and start this second learning lab. I just want to make sure that I can see if anyone else comes in and is in, and is in the, the waiting room. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think it'll probably pop up and say that. They'll probably send a thing. Okay, cool. Okay, so can you guys see my slides? You see yes. Yes. purple? <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, this is the second lesson that um, they're doing. I'm so excited to be part of it. Um, and it's going to be on college applications and a little bit about like what's going on in the world right now. It's, it's a crazy time for, for kids to be applying to schools. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any specific questions related to this application cycle. Um, but if you do, please, please just like stop me and ask whatever questions that you have. Um, because I want to make sure that I address anything that may be on your mind that I don't cover. Um, so who I am, I've linked up with Andrew. Um, I am a high school guidance counselor. Um, I've been there for six years. Um, I'm doing some training through UC Berkeley. Um, I have my doctorate in educational leadership uh, from NOVA. Um, so I've been doing this for, for a while now. Um, and again, it's, it's something that I really enjoy because I know how stressful of a time it can be for so many families. And if I can alleviate any bit of that, you know, to kind of put them at ease and, you know, know that they're being guided the best they can be, um, it's, it's really enjoyable for me to, to be able to do that. Um, most people <laughs> will start this process, I would say, the best time is around junior year um, in the springtime to start working with a college counselor if you are going to work with somebody. But at any point of the process, you could really, you know, get with somebody and they can help you <coughs> with a small part or a big part. Um, but I guess square one, I would say, would be starting to come up with a list of your schools of, you know, where you would want to apply, um, which is kind of challenging for some and for some it's it's easy because they kind of know what they've you know had on their mind and heart of what they wanted for you know as, as when since, since they were little kids um but the, the 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 main starting point i would say is that you want to at least get around probably seven to ten schools some people's list will be smaller than that um but i think that that's a good range um, you want to start distributing them into different areas. So the breakdowns um, are between like your safety school, the one that you will almost certainly get into, um, possible school that it's like not totally out of the ballpark or um, super competitive to get into, and then um, the long shot or reach schools. Um, so that's how you would divide the list. So how do you figure out which goes where? Um, you would start looking to see where their middle 50%, like their averages are, if you look to see how competitive they are. Um, so any school with, I'd say, you know, less than 50% admittance is considered competitive. Um, anywhere that is 20% or less, and all these statistics are online, if you were to just Google a school, you could quickly see you know, what their average GPA is, what their average test scores were, um, and how competitive they are in their percentages for acceptance. Um, schools, I have it listed here, that are, they say that they have acceptance rates of 20% or lower. Um, I know it sounds kind of crazy, um, but the reality is, is that those are all pretty much reach schools um, for anyone who's even super competitive. Um, just because those schools are, having to fill a pool of applicants that kind of meet different things that they're looking to fill. So which is why sometimes you'll see or hear about a student getting into a school that may have a lower test score or a lower GPA than another student, um, but perhaps they had something that they needed for that particular class. Um, doesn't mean don't apply, of course, like reach for the stars. I always tell that, you know, to students, it doesn't hurt. Um, I work with a lot of kids that apply to UF and their, the, the competition there has just gone up and up throughout the years. And 
they'll, they'll say, you know, I don't know. And I'll, I'll say, well, apply. I mean, you have nothing, you know, to lose. Um, and so as long as you have that, you know, that, that place to fall back on and then have a little bit more realistic um, options, I, I think it's good to have that, that range of schools. Um, so the GPA, the rigor of your coursework, and what I mean by that is um, if you're taking AP classes, dual enrollment, um, if you're involved in you know, an ACE program, um, they're gonna consider all of those different factors um, when looking at your transcript. For seniors, I, I don't know if there's any seniors or senior parents on here, um, but you're gonna want to look at your student's transcript um, with a fine comb to make sure that everything is on there that should be. Um, maybe classes that they took in middle school for high school credit um, or uh, classes they may have remediated or taken through like an online provider um, to make sure that it's on there. Um, this is something, I, how will you know if a school is a good fit? Um, we've got the kids that are totally clueless, which is okay as to knowing where they wanna go. And then you've got the, you know, the students that have been sleeping in, you know, their Gators or FSU shirt, you know, since they um, were able to dress themselves. So they both are, are totally okay. Um, but I do always encourage people to have an open mind um, and, you know, have conversations, you know, with their parents or family friends or counselors or older siblings to um, just have an open mind and know that what's for you might not necessarily be what's the best option for everybody else. Um, sometimes there are popular schools, especially um, within the state system um, for the obvious financial perks. Um, if you stay in state, it's um, traditionally um, cheaper than if you were to go out of state. So that's why it's, it's super attractive to a lot of uh, students who are applying to schools. Um, even really, really, talented, gifted students. Um, I, I did a blog post um, for IBIS talking about national merit and why that's such a big deal is not only for the prestige, but if you were to score within a certain um, index on there, you would get your, the full cost of tuition covered for most of the Florida schools, including the University of Miami, which is private, um, super expensive, and they would cover all that along with different stipends. Um, so that's why people get really hyped up for that junior PSAT that they take because that's what it counts for. Um, so that is about a little bit about your transcript. Um, you're gonna wanna look to see what each school requires. Um, I talk a little bit about how to like organize yourself a little bit later on, but this is still talking about like family conversations of things that you should be talking about um and really thinking about i mean i remember that when i applied to college a lot of these things weren't necessarily on my mind and looking back i'm like well, why didn't i stop to really you know think about these things um a lot of stuff at that age and everyone's different like you'll have the, the people that kind of have it all together and then you have the others that like i was that was a little bit clueless at the time um but you you want to think about yourself. Like I went to a small liberal arts school and that actually wound, I got lucky. It wound up being really great for me because I was able to have small class sizes, um, develop, you know, personal relationships with my teachers. You can do that at a bigger school. It's just a little bit, you know, more challenging. And I do think that I got a little more attention for what I was comfortable with at the time with like going outside of my comfort zone. Um, I, Andrew, what was it like you for your undergrad? Did you like find it super, how big were your class sizes? Well, I actually just asked a question in the chat room too. Ooh. Let's see. <laughs> Don't worry. <I> just... <laughs> Shoot, hold on, let me see. Let me see if I can find it somewhere. Oh, chat, here we go. When should students decide which schools they want to apply and how many? Okay, so you are gonna wanna apply, I would say probably around seven to 10. And some, some people a little bit less, um, but I would say that that's the kind of like the rule for that. And when should they apply? I, or when should they decide where they want to apply? I'd like to say probably like summer leading up to senior year. 
um, that would be the ideal time for them to start narrowing down um, those schools. And when is it too late? Like, what if, you know, you, you decide you have a calling to go to this school and you're a senior and it's, you know, November or September, like when is it too late yeah. and basically? It's gonna, yeah, that's a really good question. It's gonna depend on the school. So like I have, where is it? To give you an idea, I'm just gonna bounce. Okay, you can, no, it's okay. You can, you can get there when we get there. Yeah, um, but it's gonna depend on the school because there's different cycles of when you can apply. Um, early decision, the main ones I would say are early decision, early action, and then regular decision. Um, so schools have their deadlines. Um, UF, for example, they know they do have that strict November 1st deadline. They will take you, I think, until applicants until May, but they're only considering them based on the room that they have. Um, so that's why it's, even if schools have like regular decision, I really encourage kids to try to have their applications in within that early cycle. Um, that's kind of what I was getting at. It seems that the best plan of action is by the start of senior year, ideally, to have the school in mind that you want to apply to and then have a plan to apply as early as possible to each one of those schools. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, there's something called early decision, um, but that is that I wanted to mention too. Not all schools offer early decision, but early decision is a binding agreement. So you, it sounds great because it's like, oh, you know, that's the early, like if you have your heart set on a school, um, but you're committing to that school 100%, no matter what like financial aid award they're gonna give you. Um, so that's why people, I mean, your parents actually have to sign an agreement saying that they're okay with you applying in that route. Um, so it's gonna take, you know, a serious conversation with a family to see if it's financially, you know, gonna be able to be feasible. Um, without whatever aid that they're going to give um, and then making sure wholeheartedly that your your heart is on that school so there's deadlines for that um, early action is not binding and that's really the one that for the schools that are between ED and um, early action I would say go early action unless you you know again have those serious cool. conversations um, so yeah you you I was asking you when should they know what schools and how many schools and you're saying it's it's best if, if they know going into senior year and narrowing a list down to seven or ten now yeah. i heard you say it doesn't matter how many like to apply but it, there is a cost of application right to each school there is there's um waivers um based on like if you receive certain aid at your school that your counselor can potentially give you that for like if you're receiving some type of financial aid or if you're you know on a free or reduced lunch things like that but there are costs to apply to school so you know depending sure. on sometimes it gets a little excessive you know you don't want to I mean <laughs> apply to a million um, and also just because you apply to a million really hard schools doesn't mean that it increases your chances per se to get into those you know right um, so if you were applying to let's say nine what, how would you balance it between what you call reach schools and what you think are schools that you should get into and then I guess they're called safety schools that you're guaranteed to get into? Yeah. Maybe three, three, and three, or how would you recommend yeah. that? Yeah, no, that's exactly really like how I would divide it. So equally divided, um, and you're going to look at the mid-range of the admitted students' um, GPAs. Um, some schools... I know my school, so we are a college prep school, so we give our students a little bit extra weight um, to all of their classes, even if they're not honors or AP, and some schools, other schools do that as well. Um, but then when our kids apply, it depends on the university. Some people take that little bit of extra weight out and some keep it. Um, so a lot of the time students GPAs are lower than what they think they are because once a university gets their transcripts they kind of pull certain things out and adjust. Right and I, I'm sure you're going to talk about this but it, the SAT and ACT is a big factor of your application as well besides just the GPA. 
Yeah, no, that's like a, definitely a big thing that I wanted to touch on tonight. Um, I, when schools started saying that they were becoming test optional, um, first of all, Florida is dragging their feet with that. And I don't think they're going to budge. <laughs> I don't. I, I really think that they're going to stick with it um, in this cycle to keep schools with students having to submit scores. Um, Miami. Or, uh, just for the student, you know, for people who are interested, you know, they stopped administering the SAT, ACT during the COVID-19 crisis in the spring. Have they started administering those tests again? They did. So there were just two back-to-back -back ones um, this past weekend and the weekend before um, for the SAT that were, were available. I don't know of any cancellations. I mean, and we're in a hot spot right now. Um, I know my school hosted it successfully. Um, and there's going to be an SAT pretty much offered every month from here on out. Um, so students, student, I mean, for instance, we, we were talking with a, a student named Ryan who is in 10th grade. He yeah. should still be um, preparing for SAT, ACT as a, a main factor of his college application. Yeah, no, for sure. Ryan, like, and I'm not just saying this because it's a test prep company, but the reality is, is that like, so schools saying that they're test optional besides like just pleasing people, you know, that are, have been having limited testing options and like looking good people, there's other factors that they're doing it. And one of them has to do with that. The, the more publicity that they have that they're test optional, the more applications they're going to receive, which means the more money they're going to get. And then also they're going to be able to reject more students. Okay. And that's going to make them more prestigious because they're going to have a, what's that called? More selective percentage of admitted students, you know, so they're going to look more competitive. So they have other incentives, like for their own personal reasons, as opposed to like necessarily like wanting to help the students. Um, I hate to like speak negatively in that way, but it is the, the reality, you know, that they are businesses and this test optional policy is something that's going to um, put blinders on some people because just because a school is test optional, it doesn't mean that they're test blind or that they don't value scores. So those students that are able to produce a score that's competitive, they're going to be so much more attractive to a school because they're able to see them on that playing field compared to other students in the United States. If you just present your, your transcript and your, your GPA, yeah, that's great. And it, it's definitely something that speaks highly to a student, but one school may be totally different than another school. And that's why standardized testing, I feel, is something that will always be, you know, in existence because you have to have something that puts everybody on the same playing field. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're saying that standardized testing is still, is, in the foreseeable future, even in light of COVID, it's still an important factor of the application. You talked about how your GPA is an important factor. And then the other thing would be, I guess, extracurriculars and yeah. And, also for scholarship opportunity, like for testing, Florida Bright Futures, you need to have a certain score. Also like for universities that give out money, um, you know, based off of once they get your FAFSA and, you know, determine like how much your family's supposed to contribute. Like it, it, they go off of not only your, your grades, but also your scores to determine if they're going to give you money from the school to entice you to come there. Um, so I don't think it's going away. And I think that just besides like getting into the school, there's the money to consider and making sure that you are, you know, producing everything that you can to paint the biggest and best picture of who you are as an applicant. And when it comes to these extracurriculars, what are the, what do colleges value the most? You know, I know there's so many people you could play sports, join clubs, like what, what do you find that schools really value? They want to see leadership. So it's not necessarily that you're involved with a million things, you know, or that you like went around from this to that. They want to see consistency and they want to see that you have, you know, worked your way to become like a leader of that. So if you play sports, they want to see that you're the team captain or that you um, have started um, fundraising like initiatives within your team. Um, you know, like we have, um, 
are very competitive soccer team. So we won states this past year and our girls for National Honor Society, I know they need leadership positions. So yes, there's the captain that everyone's usually, you know, gunning for, but also we've kind of like created little loopholes for them that, you know, we do a lot of fun, um, fundraising and different, you know, initiatives throughout the, with the community as the team. So we give those girls leadership positions within that. So for students, I would say, sometimes you have to think a little bit outside the box, um, you know, and those types of positions may have to be those created for you. Um, and, and, you know, develop relationships with the people that are overseeing certain activities, um, you know, to, to because things are always, you know, willing to expand, you know, because everyone's looking for leadership opportunities that we sometimes have to create them for students, you know, to give them, you know, sure. an opportunity for that. I like what you're talking about, how it's a family conversation, because, you know, if you have a younger student, you want to think, how can you best position this student to get into the best school? And from what I'm hearing, it's a combination of factors of having a good GPA, having good test scores, and then doing the right extracurriculars that the school's value, which you're yeah. saying is, is positions. So yeah. I think that's, that's great so far. I, I definitely want you to continue on with the PowerPoints. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. The family thing I think is just so important, you know, to discuss it, you know, um, because e your family knows you very well, you know, and they can ask questions like, Hey, what, okay, but you understand that it snows in Boston. Like, are you, you know, to, to maybe they say go and visit a school like in the winter if you're from Florida to see like how you're gonna actually because that's a big adjustment for people that are from here. Um, my sister goes to George Washington and um, for graduate school and she had to learn how to you know use the the metro system and all of that stuff and as a Florida kid like that it took some getting used to you know um, great experience but some people will love it and some people will be like eh this isn't for me I don't know about you know, um, I know that NACAC is doing um, virtual college visits. Um, if you can see it on the screen, these are the dates if you want to take a screenshot. And you, you can log in and ask questions to specific schools um, that are going to be on there. I'm sure that there's like a way to only pop into certain schools that you're interested in. Um, here's also more resources of things that you can look at to see. Um, schools and looking and to see what they major in and kind of like narrowing down as to what may be a good fit for you. Um, Naviance is fantastic. Not every school has it, um, but if your school has it, for sure use it. Um, I love, my favorite feature on there is the scattergram that I can see at our school, the students that were accepted, denied, or waitlisted. Uh, it doesn't show their names to the students, but it shows like where they fell in regards to their years of being of when they applied and if they were accepted or waitlisted denied all of that um because where you go to school plays a pretty big role in the school having an idea of who you are and where you come from so it's good to kind of see and ask you know your your college counselor or your guidance counselor however your department is broken up those questions like hey, have we ever had any students get into there? You know, what was their experience, you know, and, and talk about those things. Um, so I would say make a folder for each school that you're gonna apply to with all the deadlines, all the materials that you'll need, narrow it down, write if there's gonna be supplemental essays because sometimes you have like your standard um, essay, but then there's also supplemental ones that they, that they include, especially the more competitive schools that you apply to. Um, they usually have extra, you know, components to their application that they want. Um, FAFSA opened up. Um, everyone should apply for that um, on the website, regardless of your parents' financial situation. Um, and that is how they determine, you know, how much aid you're eligible to, eligible to receive and what different types of grants that there are. Um, there's something also called the CSS profile. Certain schools require you to fill that out as well, and, and it helps with your, your finances. The sooner you file, um, the more money you're likely to receive. Um, so we usually say to file early. Um, familiar self, familiarize yourself with those terms that I talked about a little bit earlier 
about early decision, early action, rolling admission. Rolling admission is basically like an open period of when you can apply. So let's say you apply this week, you should hear back within you know two weeks um, for some of those schools. UCF is rolling, FGCU is rolling, um, Nova Southeastern University is rolling. Um, so those are a few different ones. Um, for your college counselor, um, talk to them early. You know, if you haven't scheduled an appointment, um, now is definitely the time uh, to go ahead and do so to make sure that you're gathering all of those documents and to learn your school system of how you request things. Um, if you have a program like Naviance, you're typically going to request your letters of recommendation through there. Um, in addition to like talking to your teachers um, specifically to ask them. Some schools aren't taking letters of recommendation, uh, but it's good to have them in case you are applying to schools that do take them. There's also early decision two at some places. So again, that's the binding one that you're, you have to go there, but some schools give you like an option to apply a little bit later. So that way you can have more time to make a decision if you want to apply um, ED and, um, you know, to, to maybe submit a higher test score um, and perfect your essays or whatever else you need to do before the time comes. There is a higher chance that you will be admitted as an ED student if you are applying that route. Um, only if you're competitive though. So if you're not falling within the range of what they're looking for, it doesn't mean that you're going to be accepted. But if you are within the range of what they're looking for, um, applying early decisions sometimes will like even double the chances that you get in because they know that you're going to go there. You're like a solid, you know, sure thing for them. And schools worry about their yield of, you know, if they accept all these kids that are, you know, super smart and X, Y, and Z, I mean, they also know that those kids are getting into other places too and they may not choose them. So they want to make sure that they have a good amount of those people that they accept that are actually going to go there. Um, these talked about ED, regular decision, rolling. Um, these are the, the, the different platforms for applying. So many schools use the common application, which is fantastic because you could put all your stuff on there and it stores. Um, they use the same essays. Um, so that's just an easy, you know, one that you can apply to multiple schools through. There's also the coalition, universal, individual school applications. Certain states have shared applications. I'm pretty sure like the UC schools all have a shared application. Um, you can find out from the school's website directly, you know, to see which one that you prefer. Um, this was last year's um, admission cycle. So for the class of 2020 that just graduated, um, it gets more and more competitive every year. It really does. Um, you know, so it's good for students to know this early on. Um, Ryan, as a sophomore, like, it's good for you to know this and share this with your friends because a lot of the times kids think like, oh, junior year is when I'm going to start trying. But the reality is, is that you know, your, your, your GPA begins your freshman year and it's sometimes so hard to recover from that, you know, once you have it down, you know, so you want to start off strong to begin with. Um, can, can I ask you something? Yeah. These, these GPAs are, are, are weighted because they're weighted from, from back in my day. <laughs> no, I know it's changed drastically. <laughs> so, so it is interesting, you know, because kids are averaging over 4.0 GPAs? Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's okay. crazy. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah. Again, I, I, I think that that is another reason why the, the, the standardized test scores have their value is because if all the different high schools have a different system of GPAs, then it could be difficult to, you know, objectively compare students. But you know, the, the SAT, ACT score is the same for all students. So that, that's really interesting to see that, that the average GPA at FIU is 4.3. I know, FIU made a huge jump, you know. Um, cool. the, the big one for me that really stands out, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but I remember FJUCU used to be the super safety school, like for, for students that were in like the 2.8 GPA range. And then remember they became Dunks, was it Dunk City? 
at like yeah, they sure. won, they made it to the, the, the final four or whatever. Um, and well, and put them on the map like significantly. In general, and I, I was going to ask you about this, but and I do want to know how you feel about coronavirus affecting it. But even before that, I think every year it seems to be more and more competitive that, you know, more talented students are applying to schools, more international students are applying to schools. And, you know, nowadays getting into University of Florida is like what it was like to get into Harvard when I was a student. Yeah. And um, what, what, what about, like, what do you recommend for, for students in, uh, with that information? Is, it, is, is, it, is, that the tr is that the truth that it's getting more difficult and more challenging to get accepted into schools? Oh my gosh, a million percent, you know, and international students, I mean, especially coming from China, like a lot of them are paying full price, you know, so that is something that a lot of universities rely on, you know, to be able to financially, you know, survive. Um, there was a lot of things going on with COVID and immigration that a lot of the, you know, schools wrote letters to the government because of how much it was going to impact them financially. Um, you know, because they wanted to have those students on campus, not only, of course, because having international students introduces, you know, our, our kids to different cultures, and it's a great experience, you know, to them, for them to interact with students of, of all different places, you know, and, um, but also from a financial standpoint, it's something that, you know, raises a lot of competitiveness for American kids um, to, to be competing right. with that. Um, well, for, for people that are here that are in the audience, because, you know, at some point, I do want to open it up for everyone to ask some questions. But the great thing is about you having you on our staff is that you, together, we offer these packages to students where they can work with you for, you know, five hours or 10 hours or whatever package they decide. And you can really help them craft the perfect application. Because it's really dawning on me how valuable the it is to have someone do that for you. And I know a lot of these kids, you know, I, I'm sure these public schools don't have the attention that, from their guidance. It's like one guidance counselor for 300 kids. So, yeah. you know, I hope parents understand how valuable it would be to work with you and really craft their application with these factors in mind that it's very difficult. You're competing against a higher um, talent level and there's so many factors, the GPA, the, the test score, the extracurriculars, when you apply, and you're even talking about strategies and early decision rolling. And I just think that every, every case is different and it depends yeah. on where you want to go, what you want to study, and you can really help them and the parents come up with like, a best plan of action to increase your odds. Would you say that's that's? Yeah, you know, and it's simple things too that you just don't know because you're not in the field. You know, like how you describe your activities in your activity section. You know, I mean, okay, I'm filling out my activity section. Like, who would think to put a spin on that? You know what I mean? Like, you're gonna put JV soccer. You know, but the reality is, like, and you could put, you know, from how do I put this? Like you could describe it as like that you had never played before and you rose to become a starter, like in little creative things that like somebody looking at your application could be like, oh, this kid's funny. Like, you know, like little things like that or your essay. I mean, I am the biggest sports person in the world. Like I played college soccer, like I help coach a, a really competitive um, state championship team. And I tell my girls, don't write about soccer in your college essay. <laughs> like they're going to see that you, you know, in all these other parts about your application, write about something else that's going to give them insight into who you are. But if I don't tell them that, they don't know that. I mean, admissions counselors read a million bajillion essays about sports, you know, or things that, you know, and it's not that it's not a good story or compelling story or that it's not important or a big part of who they are, but you know, it's those little things that I on the inside do know about that can give, you know, them little tips here and there. And it's not that there's anything wrong or that they're thinking, you know, wrong or anything like that. It's just that, you know, I see this every day. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot from you. And that's, a, you know, I, I'm sure every kid writes about the big game where yeah. they're the, and 
I probably wrote about that too. And I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. But <laughs> I think I did too. <laughs> I know what you're saying. So my question is, how important is the essay as part of the college application? Um, we talked about GPA. We talked about um, test score. We talked about extracurriculars. What about the essay? Is that the fourth piece, would you say? It is. It's very important for very competitive schools. Now, for less competitive schools, they don't necessarily, uh, it's not going to matter as much, you know, because they're going to be taking those students with the GPAs and the SAT scores or ACT scores. But those really selective schools, they get so many applicants with high GPAs and high SAT scores that they are looking for those other pieces that really make the students stand out. So I say the more selective the school, the more important the essay. Um, or smaller schools like that have time to, to really sit and read them. Um, sure. so I, I do think it's an important, an important piece of a student's application. Awesome. I definitely want to get back to the PowerPoint. I noticed you didn't put University of Miami. Oh, oh uh, hold on, hold on. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we have their, their dates there. And then Miami is a, a competitive school as well. I mean, they're right up there, uh, I would say, you know, with the University of Florida, Florida State right now in terms of like their admissions criteria to get in. Um, so UF is leading the pack, but Miami, you know, I mean, Miami's a really good school too. And it's not a cakewalk to get in there either. Yeah, I went to, um, I went to Tulane for undergrad. Mm -hmm. I remember which that. I took advantage of a situation where um, Hurricane Katrina had, had, had impacted the city a few years prior, and they were more or less desperate for students. They were giving out scholarships, and I, nowadays, I don't even know if I would have gotten into the school, let alone on scholarships. So, you know, yeah. consider that different times in history, maybe there's different reasons to go to different schools. I was really, it was important to me to go to New Orleans and rebuild the city. I, I, I was like young and I thought that yeah. would be, uh, well, I don't know, it, it was. I'm not saying it wasn't. It, I, I ended up being able to do that and that was cool. So my, sure. adv my advice to kids these days is don't just think about the university. Also think about where you're gonna be living for the next few years because you know it, it could be really difficult if you move to a, a place where you're not happy. So you wanna think about you know, what kind of, I, I don't know, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, oh my gosh, 100%. I think I like had that earlier somewhere. I don't know where it is, but just as a conversation piece, like you have to think about eventually, like you're looking to get a job after this, you know, and for somebody that wants to go into, let's say, you know, politics or, or go into law or something, you know, DC, uh, you know, American University, Catholic University, George Washington, you know, those are all you know, putting you in a place, you know, to connect with different people in that workforce um, that you can get a really good job after you graduate because you're interning, you know, in a place that is so accessible to those professions, you know, that's why I think it's really good for like kids to, 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 to ask these questions. Okay, well, like, what are your graduates doing now? Like, what opportunities did your students have while they were a student there that helped them grow in their development? What internships, externships, um, things in that city that helped them grow as individuals to make them attractive once they were ready to get out into the workforce. So, yeah. Um, do you find that um, students should know what they want to major in before college or that's kind of like an individually tailored discussion for each student? It's going to be different from student to student. Um, I, I, I think you it's good. know that you wanted to be in education when, when you had no idea? No. Okay. No, I didn't. I had no idea. I think I changed my major like three times in college. <laughs> I, I wanted to go to law school. So I did undergraduate um, degrees that, you know, I didn't necessarily know which, which majors I wanted, but I knew that I wanted them to be applicable for the practice of law. And yeah. I do think that helped me, but then again, you know, some people I know went into school to be doctors and they came out being architects. I mean, it, it really is different for each person. 
Um, That's why most of the schools have you taking those core, you know, classes the first two years. Um, but it, it's not to say that it's important for students to start thinking about what they want to do more and, and because it's exciting. Once you have an idea of what you want to do, you get so motivated to, to become that, you know, um, right. and you're actually, you know, going towards a field that you like, you enjoy your classes. And that's something that, you know, a lot of, like, I remember being, going into my junior year and I was done with math and <laughs> all the classes I didn't like. And I actually liked going to class and raising my hand because, you know, and that's how I knew that I was in the right place. Um, so for, for students, I think it's good for them to do career interest inventories. You know, there's tons of different things. Go to career, um, like career zones or career days or. What is a career interest inventory? So they have, like we use it through Naviance where basically a student takes a quiz and it kind of get, get, uh, groups them into um, different areas that they may be interested in. Um, my younger, sister, my younger sister did this um, in college and she's actually at GW start studying speech pathology. She didn't know what speech pathology was <laughs> at the time. And then she got it on her entrance inventory and started looking into it. So that's like a crazy example that like it actually propelled her into like her current career of what she's almost done with. My, my only thought is, you know, as it gets more competitive, it may be as you said, a little bit advantageous to have some direction, you know, where, whereas my parents back in their day, it was like, you know, just go to school for anything and you'll all figure it out kind of. And yeah. then and more and more, like the more focus you have, the more, like you said, you have that passion and you can start pursuing it and maybe, you know, getting a little bit further in advance. But then again, everyone is different. There's nothing wrong with a holistic, general education and yeah. it, it's all part of um, yeah i don't i wouldn't want to like rush anyone into anything but at the same time it does it is cool when you are applying and somebody's looking at your application and they have an idea of who you are you know what i mean and what you're passionate about so it's like kind of like this i watched a ted talk and it was like they compared careers to dating and it was saying how like people will not date careers. They're like, okay, I have to study this and then I'm gonna become this and then that's that. Whereas like people will date somebody and be like, okay, I don't like this. I kind of like that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Until they eventually leads to them to the person that they're like supposed to be with. You know, we so rarely like get introduced to little pieces of careers now. It's kind of like we all just feel so forced to pick something and then just like pursue that when it might not be the the, the perfect fit for us, you know? Awesome. Let's, um, let's try and wrap up the PowerPoint so we can yeah. open it up to um, I'm trying to think of like what else is important on here. Um, letters of recommendation. Um, sure. I would recommend core, um, core teachers in core subject areas, not necessarily the class that you're doing the best in. Like if you're taking dance, don't have your dance teacher write your letter of recommendation, you know, like you should be going to somebody that, you know, is, is a core subject area, you know, just because you have an A in dance and you may have a low B in math, like that math teacher is going to know you more, more like academically and be able to write what they're looking for on there. Um, I said, I, I could add to this. I remember when I was in high school, if you have a teacher that you think will write a good letter of recommendation, recognize that so does every other kid in school and that teacher's busy. So get to them early. Like, or her, you know, kind yeah. of, I, wh when should you ask, would you recommend junior year? I would year say before? junior year before they leave for the summer. Yeah, junior year before they leave for the summer. Don't wait until se senior year because then you'll be in line with all the other kids. That, that happened to me where I didn't even get a letter of recommendation from the teacher I really wanted to because by the time I asked him, he said, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. And those yeah, yeah. popular teachers, just like you said, get so many kids asking them, how much right. do they really modify those letters, you know, like, so, and you're competing against the other kids in your school. So like, they're just reading, do, yeah. Do you really want a basic core class and get a good recommendation your, your junior year and don't be rushing senior year with all the other yeah. kids to get a teacher, sure. A hundred percent, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. 
this letter of recommendation can be from any teacher or just current teachers? Um, it can be past teachers. So it could be someone that your student um, had last year or the year before. If they're, usually if they're a current teacher at the school still, they'll take them. Yeah, so I mean, Ryan's saying like, what if you had a teacher in ninth grade social studies that you just had a really great bond with? Yeah. And now you're you can, I mean, the best ones I would say would come from probably a junior year teacher. Um, that's the ideal person, but everyone's situation is gonna be different. You know, you may not have that relationship that you had with your ninth grade teacher. Like, it's gonna depend. And how many do you get? And do you only get them from teachers or do you get them from like your coaches or your mentor, or, you know, other people or what do you recommend? Um, you get them from one from your guidance counselor um, and then two typically teacher recommendations. I think all, a lot of the Florida schools aren't taking letters of recommendation because they just don't, they don't find them as valuable. Um, but okay. yeah, and no, I, I'd say no coaches. And I have that dual role as a guidance counselor and a coach. And I always leave out that I'm a coach in their letter because it just, right. I would be, it, it would do them a disservice um, because I would be biased, you know? And it's better to not let them know that. <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of times students don't recognize that when you apply to a college, you're applying as a student, as, as someone who is, a, you know, going to be involved in education. If you were, if, you were, if your athletics were that important, then you would be getting an athletic position at the school your position at the school is in academics <clears throat> so you want your your resume to highlight your academic prowess yeah and even if you are an, an athlete like it's student athlete student like is the first one you know so you want to always lead with that foot forward awesome um so yeah i mean I go into a little bit about the essay and making it more, you know, how to describe your activities. These are all things that like I'm here for if anyone wants to work on those later on. I talk a little bit about. Well, um, Christina, I just got a message from one of the parents who says they want to have the PowerPoint emailed to them, which is yes. definitely so. Yeah, anyone who wants the PowerPoint emailed to them, uh, we're going to make it available. Um, we're, we're totally accessible. This, this lecture is going to be put on YouTube and the PowerPoint will be sent to any parent that is interested because we are skipping through a lot of slides in the interest of time. But yeah. I agree with the parent, like you really put a lot of really good information on this, especially about some of the financial resources. Some, like, this, this PowerPoint is gold right here. So Aww, good. I, Good. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about, you know, and I, what I love is that every student is different, you know what I mean? And every conversation with any student that you have is going to be unique to them and, you know, making them stand out the best that they can. Like, if I talk to one student, that conversation is going to be totally different than if I, you know, were to sit down with another, which makes it so fun. Um, so yeah, these are some things that I could work on. And I think right now I, I really would like to like answer questions, like you said, if anyone has anything to, to I saw last minute advice. I definitely would want to hear that. The what? There was one slide that said last minute advice. Was that did I see that? Um uh, uh, the slide before this. Yeah. That one. Um the next one. Before it. <laughs> That's how, oh, well, SP said the vibe. Yeah, what is this? Hold on, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm like moving it, hold on, I'm trying oh, to. It's about the personal statement. Oh, okay, like some people struggle to find like what to talk about. Um, and I say one of the pieces of advice is to look around your home and see if something pops out to you um, that you could talk about and work into like a creative story. You know, I mean, I started to think about this um, and for example, my home growing up, my mom's name is Jeannie and I, I don't have like a specific of how, like the direction of the route that I would go in, but my mom's best friend Cheryl got her this like really beautiful crystal like I dream of Jeannie like lamp thing that's just like randomly in our house and being Italian, 
family values, having close knit relationships, like the value of family. And like my mom's the godmother to, to Cheryl's son. Like that's something that's like super of value to me. You know, that that's a big part of who I am. Like, I don't know how I could have worked that into my college essay, but had I they be, been doing this now, like at 18 instead of 30, I would have probably had a lot to write about, you know, in knowing how I could twist that into something that a, a, an admissions officer would be like, oh, this is really cool. I wouldn't have known this about her through any other part of her application. This is a really great slide. And, you know, um, I think my brother's actually in the room with us. And I remember this when I was in high school that he had trouble thinking about what to write about on his application. Because, you know, he was just like a good kid. He had good grades. He did good things. But he's like, you know, he wasn't like a, a Shakespearean storyteller. And mm -hmm. I remember like him and my mom like having this debate about what it should be about. So, and, and if you go up to that last slide, you, you were just on about the one-on-one. -on -one, uh, oh, okay. Here are just things. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm like Ryan, like you're in 10th grade. I mean, I, that would be perfect. Like I, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, it doesn't matter what grade level. I mean, the more time that I would have to work with somebody, the better, um, because we could start planning and plotting. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, what, what Christine offers and what, what we have collaborated is personal guidance so that students who don't have, you know, sufficient resources or they want additional resources can work one-on-one -on -one with Christine and she'll help you with everything, even those little points like, what should you write your essay about? And I'm sure you have a great little exercise of, of figuring those things out and, and putting all those pieces together is really what it takes to put yourself in the best position to get into your dream school. So Christine, thank you so much. This was really, oh, really it's awesome. Um, I definitely want to open it, open the floor up to anyone in the room that has any questions um, for Dr. Christine Mastandrea. <laughs> I think we should go back to Ryan. What, what was on your mind that you, uh, <laughs> you were thinking about? Or is, is there a How would I know what to categorize my schools to? Like safety or competitive? So you're gonna look and see like what the mid-range GPAs are? and see if you fall within there. Um, and you're gonna look at their mid-range test scores and see if you fall within there, okay? So, but I would think a student like Ryan, he's, what, what are you in Ryan, in what grade? 10th. Um, 10th grade. He hasn't taken the SAT or ACT, but you have taken the PSATs, right? Yeah, I took one last year. Can you, do you feel that usually you could kind of estimate what your SAT score is going to be on your PSAT score? How would someone like Ron know what his SAT score is going to be if he's only in 10th grade? <laughs> yes and no. Um, so many students test prep now that it's become the norm that there's jumps. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know about you, Andrew, but I remember like when I was in high school, like I, there was kind of this misconception is that like you're as smart as you are and you're going to do how you do and that's going to be that but the reality is is like kids can boost their scores significantly um you know in learning test taking strategies um and learning how to become good test takers that they don't do that usually until i would say the spring of their sophomore year which is after their psat so i do see a lot of big jumps so yes it's an indicator of like how they're going to do however not 100% because a lot, I mean, the majority of students, they're going to test prep and they're going to make jumps. Right. And, and the same thing with the A, too. I mean, who's to say you can't do very well your, your year and beginning of senior year and, and boost your GPA up? So I think, you know, the way to answer that question is figure out where it is you want to go, what schools you would be happy at, and kind of a little bit yourself about you know, is your GPA here? Are you that good of a test taker? And, and kind of narrow it down to like, what are 20 schools that, that you're interested in? And then I, I, I would say, Christine, do your research, right? Like, yeah. each school has different, what'd you say? And you, you mentioned cities. Look at cities that you may like have visited or, you know, 
because there's certain places there is that like this is it factor too I know with COVID, like people aren't traveling as much. And I know that, you know, for some people, like there's going to be limited, you know, options to go and do campus visits. Um, but there's so many cool places out there, you know, and I think it's great, you know, for kids to experience different, different places. You talked about Florida Bright Futures and, and, and that's a program we have in Florida where if you do well enough, you get, you know, significant scholarship money. Is that yeah, so here, am I still sharing my screen? I have the actual numbers somewhere on here. Um, how much does it pay? So you can see the top version and then the lower version. Um, so that also, that's your test scores, that's your GPA, and that's your volunteer hours. So you have to have 100 volunteer hours for the top and then 75 for the lower, 3.5 or 3.0. And then you can see the test scores there. And it's a good amount of money. It's like, you know, not full cost of attendance, but your tuition. Um, and and, that, and could then, that could potentially be FIU, Florida State, University of Florida, UCF, US, yeah. like a lot of schools. Yeah, and it's also applied. If you go to a, a private school, they'll apply it towards your tuition there. So it probably will not cover your, you know, tuition, but it's, it's an amount of money that will go towards that. Also, there's the Ease Grant, um, which, hey, private. which is a private, a private grant money, you know, from Florida's residents that they give you a little bit money to if you want to go to a, a private school. Is that private schools in Florida or any state? That's in Florida. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And um, you think that University of Florida right now is the most difficult school to get into in, in a state? I do. I do. I would say, yeah, it's the it's ranked. I mean, that it's number one right now in competitive and competition. What, um, what, what about outside the state? What schools have you noticed have been um, very competitive to get into? The, I mean, the Ivy League schools and the Ivy Leagues, you know, small Ivies, University of Michigan, um, you know, Vassar College. Like, there's, they're all, I mean, Andrew, I mean, there's a college for everybody. But these schools continue to get more and more competitive, you know, to get into. I mean, also, like, somebody made this point to me a few years back, and they were, like, talking about why it's easier for you to transfer into school as, like, a resident of that, that school. So, apparently, universities have to accept a certain number of in-state residents. However, they're only audited within a certain number of years, like a time, there's like a, I don't like know if I'm properly explaining this, but obviously they want to have more out of state school kids because they pay more for them to go to school there, but then they bring in transfer students from the state and it balances them out eventually by the time that they graduate. Um, so just, that was like very interesting to me that like, especially like the University of Florida will do that um, to make sure that their numbers are, are you know, well, what you're explaining is just a very complex um, environment. <laughs> That's why the value of, of someone like you exists because, you know, you can help people. And just to, to kind of let everyone know, uh, what kind of schools have your students, have they been accepted to and what, what kind of... Very, very fortunate that we have two departments. So we have a college department and a guidance department. Um, so I do not work in the college office, but I work as a guidance counselor and I oversee our top 10% of, of students with a specific program that we have. Um, cool. We had um, one of our students last year get into Carnegie Mellon, um, their computer science program, which is the most competitive, you know, I think that there's only like a 3% admittance rate for that specific program. It's like crazy competitive. So that was awesome. Um, we had Columbia acceptances, um, class of 2019, I had a student um, get the Questbridge scholarship, which was a full ride to Northwestern University. Um, and that was fantastic. Um, I mean, Boston College, uh, Brown, uh, what else? I'm trying to think. I mean, there's been top tier schools. I mean, a lot of my kids will go to the University of Florida um, because it ends up being the most financially, you know, smart choice for those high achievers. Um, but we've had students have acceptances pretty much all over. That's what I've, I've re realized with the U.S. is that uh, kids could go to Harvard, but it would cost a lot of money. 
or they could go to a school in Florida for virtually for free. The best one is Florida. So you're getting kids with like Harvard qualifications going to University yeah. of Florida. Yes. I, a I lot suppose. of these kids have grad school aspirations too, that they're weighing out and they're like, well, I'm going to have to pay for grad school too. Why am I, you know what I mean? So that's like. It's a lot of things to consider. Um, in the interest of time, and because we have the heat game coming on in 24 minutes, <laughs> does it have any final questions for, for Christine? Anything at all? I, well, you guys are not going chat. anywhere. You know, if, if you something pops up. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're going to put the video on YouTube. We're going to have the PowerPoint available to everyone who joined, and um, Simran will make sure that it's available for mass distribution because I know this PowerPoint is extremely valuable to, to a lot of people. And, and we're here for any student, anytime. We, we do uh, the full gambit of, of edu services. And we just got a comment from Frankie saying it was so helpful, so. Aww. Thank you, Frankie. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. I have a um, question. Yes. So this is a little different because I'm, I'm not in high school. Um, but, he has a baby. Yeah, so uh, this is a baby. we're looking at potentially some sort of graduate program to um, really what we're looking for is just a piece of paper. So the cheapest option and the easiest like online option. How could we go about researching what our options are? For a graduate program? Yeah. What kind of graduate program? Uh, psychology like like a master's in psychology a doctoral yeah it's probably just a master's in psychology um hmm. well i mean you would have to probably look to see because there's certain programs that have like fast tracks um for the working professional too um which like i i did my uh master's at nova which is a little bit pricey but it was cool because I was able to work while I did it, you know, and it allowed me to, you know, pull in money in that way. And I was there on the weekends. Um, so I know that certain schools have like programs for working professionals that you can still work and then also are like compressed to a shorter period of time. So you like spend less money on semesters. Um, and I mean, maybe it's good. A uh, public institution is going to be cheaper than a private institution. Um, in, this, in this current environment, can you do it all online? Psychology? Um, usually you can do it online, but they are, pro I mean, I think that they probably do have full online ones, but you're going to likely have to do some type of internship or externship within the program. Right. You're going to have to like go sure. somewhere to do. Sure. That's less of a concern. I think we get that set up. We're, you know, we're taking care of a baby and working full time. Aww. so. Yeah, yeah but there's, I mean, there's definitely options for graduate, you know, especially in the field of psychology with like the working professional or someone that, you know, is at home with a baby to be able to still do it. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Oh, good. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Let's go heat. And Christine, that was amazing. Super helpful. I, I, I Thanks for being here, guys. All right, have a good night. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.